Bonjour et bienvenue à cet événement des Têtes à Papineau en ligne. Uh, welcome to this Bacon and Eggs, Egg Eds meeting. My name is Richard Boudreau. I am a uh, repeat entrepreneur and a professor at uh, Polytechnique Montreal and the University of Waterloo, and I will be your host today. Uh, pour suivre votre événement en français, uh, veuillez utiliser le bouton de traduction uh, simultanée qui est au bas de votre écran. Uh, comme on dit, si bien chez nous, uh, à Montréal, être une tête à papineau, c'est d'être quelqu'un de très intelligent. Et dans ce cas, dans le cas-ci, notre invité, mon ami et collègue docteur Alexandre Blais, est sûrement un de ces, de ces personnages-là. Il uh, est uh, one of the highest ranking uh, professor in, uh, in quantum uh, computing in Canada. And, and so this should be a, an interesting meeting. But first, let us begin by acknowledging the indigenous people from all lands that we are on today. Well, I, I am positioned in Montreal right now on the Iroquois uh, land. Even uh, through the, we are meeting on virtual form, we acknowledge the importance of the land which we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships with First Nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous people and their culture. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral territory of the Inuit, Métis and First Nation people that call this nation home as well. We pay respect to the traditional knowledge keepers both young and old, and honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. We are here today on the behalf of the Partnership Group of Science and Engineering, which is a nonprofit umbrella of 21 national organizations, societies, and academia, representing more than 50,000 scientists and engineers throughout the country. The Bacon and Egg series is meant to offer parliamentarians and decision makers the opportunity to hear firsthand the excellent work and research work that is being undertaken in Canada. The speakers we invite are outstanding researchers and innovators of their own. But like Pepino, they must also be exceptional communicators capable of connecting the, their scientific research to the need of society. And certainly this is the case today. At the end of Dr. Blais' uh, presentation, we will have a question and answer session. You are also welcome to submit your questions at any time throughout the Q&A function on the Zoom control panel. As always, priority will be given to questions from members of parliaments and senators. We also wish to acknowledge our many sponsors shown during the pre-show presentation. You've seen all their nice logos. We are grateful to all of them, including Canary and CIFAR, who are supporting today's session. Uh, we appreciate further the support provided by our patrons, the speakers of the House of Commons and Speaker of the Senate. I will ask now Jim uh, Valbain, uh, CEO of Canary, to introduce our speaker. Thank you and have a good show. Hello, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, Jim Gadban was unable to join us, uh, but I am Catherine Antonison. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jim Gadban, our president and CEO of Canary, was unable to join us today, but I'm here representing Canary. My name is Catherine Antonison. I'm the vice president external relations at Canary and delighted to be with you today. I'm located here in Ottawa, and I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, and I'm grateful to share this beautiful land with them. For those of you not aware of Canary, we're a not-for-profit organization funded by the Government of Canada, and we are all about connections. Canary connects Canadians to technologies that equip our researchers, students, and startups 
to excel on the world stage. Together with our 13 partners in the provinces and territories, we form Canada's National Research and Education Network, a high-performance, purpose-built network connecting colleges, universities, polytechnics, SAGEPs, research hospitals, and government labs around the country supporting leading-edge research, education, and innovation that will benefit us all. Our newly launched Cybersecurity Initiatives Program connects Canada's universities, colleges, SAGEPs, and polytechnics to powerful cybersecurity tools and protocols to increase their cybersecurity capabilities and readiness across the sector. And finally, our DARE Cloud program connects Canadian startups and small businesses with transformative technologies that give them a competitive edge on the world stage. This belief in connections is one of the key reasons that Canary is proud to be a long-term sponsor of the Bacon and Egghead series. Because through Bacon and Eggheads, PAGC is able to connect leading Canadian researchers and their insights to politicians and policymakers. And as a technology not-for-profit, I can tell you that quantum computing is something we've been watching and engaging on for a number of years because not only does quantum offer great advances in, in certain scientific domains, which will have significant implications for our national research and education network, but it will also have implications, both positive and negative on cybersecurity with quantum computers likely to be able to easily break existing security protocols, but offer, also offer the possibility of quantum encryption. And because of this interest, we were delighted to see the investment in budget 2021 of $360 million over seven years to launch a national quantum strategy. And I am sure today's speaker will be a key part of this strategy. Dr. Alexandre Blais is a professor of physics at the Université de Sherbrooke. Dr. Blais is also the scientific director of the Institut Quantique and holds a research chair in quantum computer architectures. Il est co-inventor l'électrodynamique quantique en circuit, une architecture d'ordinateur quantique de pointe stimulante l'investissement mondial dans la recherche, dans la recherche sur l'information quantique. Dr. Blais is a member of CIFAR's Quantum Information Science Program, a member of the College of the Royal Society of Canada, and a fellow of the American Physical Society. His research contributions have earned him a number of prestigious academic awards, including NSERC Stacy Memorial Fellowship, Canadian Association of Physicists, Hertzberg and Brockhaus Medals, uh, Le Prix Urgel Archambault de l'Association Francophone pour le Savoir, and the Rutherford Memorial Medal of the Royal Society of Canada. I so look forward to his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alexandre Blais. Bonjour. Let me share my screens. Bonjour, maintenant que l'écran est partagé, j'aimerais vous remercier pour l'invitation à vous parler des technologies quantiques et euh, des contributions euh, du Canada dans ce domaine. Uh, I will try not to comment too much uh, first on the fact that it's snowing in Sherbrooke uh, today, but I'll rather get straight to it by saying that while quantum physics has the reputation of being a complex and even perhaps a strange science, it is nevertheless a theory that underlies many of the most significant technological advances of the recent decades. This is true of the GPSs with their atomic clocks, of medical imaging, and of lasers. These are all technologies that have emerged from quantum physics laboratories. And in fact, the same is true of our current computers that I will call in this presentation classical computers. 
indeed, at the core of these uh, machines are semiconductor materials. And to understand how to turn these materials into transistors, into computers, required quantum physics. So quantum physics is not only the most precise theory that we have to understand nature. It is also a theory that has led to transformative technologies. But the power of quantum physics to having impacts on society is far from exhausted. Uh, indeed, we've come to understand in the last decades only that uh, by actively, by more actively exploiting quantum effects, quantum effects such as quantum superpositions, entanglement and interference, and so by more actively using these effects, it is possible to arrive at technologies that far surpass what is possible currently. And there are several emerging quantum technologies, and the quantum computer is an excellent example. But to understand how quantum can help for computations, beyond what I've already said about semiconductors, it is useful to go back for a minute to how our current classical computers work. So computers are machines that deal in zeros and ones. At the, this very moment, our respective computers are exchanging strings of zeros and ones, which are interpreted as zero, uh, which are interpreted as audio and video. And this is how we can have this conversation. There are, uh, uh, these zeros are, are stored, uh, zeros and ones are stored in the billions of transistors that are found in our computers. Uh, and these transistors are a little like the, the neurons in the brain of our computer. And so each of these transistors can take the value zero or one. But thanks to quantum physics, it is now possible to create devices where these transistors are replaced by quantum transistors that I will call also quantum bits or qubits for short. And uh, these qubits can take the value zero or the value one but they can also take values that have no analogies in regular transistors. They can take the value that I'll call zero and one. So while from a mathematical point of view, the meaning of this statement is extremely well understood. From an intuitive point of view, this can however be not so clear. This can sound rather strange. Indeed, this is a little as if I was saying that the lights in your office could be on and off at the same time, or that you yourself could be at home and at work simultaneously. So when we extrapolate the concepts of quantum physics to our everyday macroscopic world, this is when things get strange. But uh, this is however how quantum physics works, or rather more precisely, this is how nature works at its most fundamental level. This is something which is verified uh, every day in laboratories worldwide. So the question is, how can we take advantage of this quantum strangeness to create vastly more powerful computers? And to try to get an uh, intuitive understanding of this, let's consider this beautiful library. So, uh, uh, I will be the first one to enter the library and I will place a piece of paper in one of the page of one of the books of the library. And your task upon entering after me is to find this piece of paper in the most efficient way. And so the strategy that you will use is very much what our current classical computer would do. You will open every page of every book one after the other until you find the answer. Our current computers would go through every possible solutions one after the other. But by using quantum superpositions, the fact that qubits can be in the strange zero and one state at once, uh, it is possible for quantum computers to simultaneously explore all of these possible solutions. It does not mean that a quantum computer can find the answer in one shot, in one go, no. Quantum algorithms have to use other effects, have to exploit other quantum effects, such as entanglement and interference, to reveal the correct answer. But the key idea is that 
by exploiting these quantum effects, it is possible to dramatically speed up some important computations. But how much of a speed up? Or in the context of this example, how many combinations uh, can be explored simultaneously? How many pages of how many books? And we know the answer to this question. If you have a quantum processor with a number n uh, of these quantum transistors that you remember we called qubits. So, so if you have n of these qubits, then there are two to the power n simultaneous combinations that can be explored. Two times two times two n times. Uh, but to understand how large this number can be, let's uh, consider a very concrete example. Let's take a quantum device, a quantum processor of very moderate size, 300 qubits. This is nothing compared to the billions of transistors that are in our current smartphone and laptops, but let's nevertheless consider this example. And so to these 300 qubits correspond two to the power 300 possibilities, two times two times two, 300 times. It is difficult to get a mental picture for how large of a number uh, this, this is, but let's try with this example. It might be helpful to say that two to the power 300 is more than the number of drops of water in the planet's ocean. In fact, that analogy is not strong enough. That image is not strong enough. Two to the power 300 is more than the number of of atoms in the visible universe. What does that mean? This means that if you were able, uh, imagine that you were able to build a classical, a non-quantum, a classical computer using all of the atoms of the visible universe, well, that massive universal scale classical computer will not be able to explore as many possibilities at once as your 300 qubit device. This is why we say that quantum for computing is really a game changer. It redefines what we mean by a computation. It uh, changes what is difficult and what is possible. It changes what computations are, uh, are easy and difficult. And so in short, quantum effects make the impossible possible. And as I just said, this is true for quantum computers that can perform otherwise impossible computations. Uh, but uh, quantum computers are just one of the emerging quantum technologies. We also have quantum sensors that are offering unparalleled sensitivity to their environment. Quantum materials with exotic properties that are opening new applications and an encrypted quantum communication with absolute security. Communication between two parties that cannot be tapped into, that cannot be broken by an unwanted third party. And while quantum, we don't have now fully functional quantum computers, these other quantum technologies are more mature. And a good example of that is quantum secure communication. Already, a few years ago, the Chinese government placed in orbit a quantum communication satellite, which allows for absolute secure communication between two cities in China uh, separated by thousands of kilometers. So this is not science fiction. This is something which is happening right now. This is in orbit right now. And Canadian scientists can be proud of these achievements of the field. Indeed, Canada has many of the leading figures of the field. And one name that absolutely has to be mentioned is Gilles Brassard from the University of Montréal. Uh, uh, Gilles, uh, already in the 1980s, introduced the concept of quantum secure communication. He's considered to be a founding father of the field of quantum information science, and he's an example of the many, many leading Canadian uh, scientists in this area. So coming back to computing, I've already said that uh, quantum computing represents a paradigm shift here. Uh, they will have, this will have impact on many areas and probably the most widely uh, known application 
and which was already mentioned in the introduction before the presentation. So one of the most widely known application is probably code breaking. Uh, we know that quantum computers can, in principle, break the most commonly used uh, form of classical encryption, something which has implications for cybersecurity. But uh, uh, this is by far not the most interesting application of these quantum computers. Other applications include optimization, optimization for risk analysis, logistic, and planning, where quantum computers can deal with much more complicated situation. Uh, modeling, modeling of new materials uh, for new applications. Also, modeling of the dynamics of small molecules. And, and why would we be interested in modeling small molecules? Well, it turns out that one of the most uh, time-consuming and costly step in the development of new drugs is the simulation of the properties of the molecules entering these drugs before they are synthesized. A quantum computer can speed up this process. And again, computing is one example. We have also quantum communication, quantum sensors, and quantum material. And so when you take all of these quantum technologies together, uh, we realize that they have a, the, the potential that they have uh, uh, for impact on society. This is true across many areas, many industries with many applications. From defense, where secret communication or cryptography is paramount, energy, where uh, a future quantum computer could be more energy efficient than our current supercomputers. Uh, health sector, I've already mentioned drug discovery and design, but also quantum sensors could render medical imaging more accurate and faster. And in the context of agriculture, uh, it, it turns out that the, the process of nitrogen fixation, which is used uh, in the in industrial production of fertilizers is quite amazingly using up to 2% of the world's energy supply. Quantum computers could be used to develop alternative processes consuming less energy, something which could help lower the, the carbon footprint of our food supply chain. And so when we take all of these examples together, we see that quantum technologies are poised to have a tremendous impact on society. Because quantum computing, quantum computers is my own area of expertise, let me uh, uh, use the next few slides to tell you a little bit more about this, the state of the art, but also what we can expect for the future. So at the moment, there are different approaches for building a quantum computer, different quantum computer architectures that are studied, that are explored in laboratories worldwide. And they take names such as superconducting qubits, trapped ions, spin qubits, topological qubits, and photonic qubits. At the Institute Quartic, uh, we are working on three of these approaches. And the work of our researchers has impact on the work done in Canadian laboratories, but also in laboratories worldwide. Academia, but also in companies, companies such as Intel, IBM, Google, Amazon, but also Canadian startups such as Montreal-based Onion Systems and Chabot-based North Quantic. And so given that superconducting qubits are arguably one of the most advanced approach uh, to building a quantum computer, and because it's the uh, research work that is done in my own group, let me tell you a bit more about this now. So the, the idea of, using, of, of building quantum computers using superconducting materials, materials that present no, uh, present no resistance to the flow of electrical currents at low temperature. So the idea of, use, of using these materials to build quantum processors, date back now to a, a little bit over 20 years. And it coincides to when I started my own graduate studies in physics at the University of Chabok. Uh, at the time, what I, I told uh, um, that I wanted to work on quantum computing for my master's degree, a reaction that I got was, well, okay, you do something fun for your master's degree, but you'll do something serious for your PhD. So <laughs> this was very much the attitude of many physicists and in fact, many scientists at the time. 
The idea of building a quantum computer looks so far is so difficult that it was not taken seriously by everyone. But things have changed dramatically since. Already in 1999, uh, researchers in Japan uh, uh, were able to demonstrate in the laboratory the first superconducting qubit, the first realization in the superconducting device of this idea of zero and one, of quantum bits, bits being in these superpositions and being able to manipulate this quantum information. And so after finishing my graduate degree uh, working in this area, I moved in 2003 to Yale University as a postdoctoral uh, fellow, where in 2004, we introduced um, what is now known as circuit quantum electrodynamics. Despite the strange name, circuit quantum, circuit quantum electrodynamics is a, a blueprint for how to build a quantum computer using superconducting device. And 15 years or so later, this is now the approach that is used by the companies that I've mentioned before, IBM, Amazon, uh, Google, but also the Canadian startups. But it is also studied by tens, if not hundreds of groups of world, uh, of academic groups worldwide. But the qubit that we were using at the time was very much based on these first generation qubits and we knew it was not uh, good enough by far. And so in 2007, we developed what is now known as the Transmon qubit, which is again used by all of the previously mentioned companies in, in group. And so in 2009, we were then able to bring together these ideas of circuit QED with Transmon to run the first quantum algorithm on a very small scale quantum superconducting processor with only two qubits. This number of qubits is nothing, again, compared to the billions of transistors in our current computers. But this was a demonstration that there is a path forward to building a quantum computer using these ideas. There are many challenges on that path, but from that point, we nevertheless saw an acceleration of the research towards that goal. And if you fast forward to today, this is all small quantum processors built on these ideas now look like. So this is a 65 qubit device built by IBM. The 65 qubits can be operated together to run simple quantum algorithms. These algorithms are certainly more complex than we were able to demonstrate back in 2009, but they are nevertheless very rudimentary. Looking ahead, uh, the company has announced their plan to reach over a thousand qubits in two years. And so as a researcher in the field now for some number of years, it's been very interesting to see how the perception of the field has changed from not being taken very seriously to being at the center stage of national security discussions. Another example of, of this change is the perception of the research that is done in my own research group, uh, which would have this, been described as curiosity-based fundamental research by everyone until recently. But given the advances that we've now seen in the last few year, years, it is now seen as applied research by some. And I have not changed the orientation of work in my group. This is simply an illustration of the evolution of the field. I think that's this uh, uh, an important reminder that while applied science gives rise to innovation, it is basic science that is the source of this innovation. And it is a illustration of the importance of supporting both. Okay, so this, this being said, um, you, you, you may wonder what, what is possible to achieve now that we have these present day rudimentary, rudimentary quantum devices. Uh, um, Although we are far from the number of qubits that are required for practical applications, uh, the answer to the question of what we can do with these devices is surprising, I think. Indeed, already more than a year ago now, researchers at Google claim uh, or reported completing, completing a computational task on their own 53 superconducting qubit device, which is illustrated here on the right which is using the same idea that I described previously. And so completing this particular task on their device took 200 seconds. Researchers at the company estimated that completing the same task on state-of-the-art classical supercomputer would take approximately 
10,000 years. We can debate the exact number of years here, but the key point is the large separation between what is easy on a quantum device and what is difficult or even impossible on, uh, a, uh, on a classical device. And here, when we're comparing, or when rather the Google researchers are comparing to classical supercomputers and not comparing to the latest uh, uh, smartphone or the um, most expensive laptop that one can buy now, no, no, the benchmark that was used by the Google researcher is Summit, the world's most, the second most uh, powerful supercomputer at a cost of a quarter of a billion dollars. Okay, this, this was the benchmark used to compare their very small quantum device uh, uh, 53 qubits only to this uh, massive computer. I think that that's an excellent illustration of the power of quantum for computation. And that uh, demonstration of a quantum advantage is not unique. Uh, only now a few months ago, December 2020, researchers uh, in China reported also completing some computational tasks, this time on 76 qubits in 200 seconds. The approach that they are using to, to build these qubits is vastly different from what I've, I've discussed before. Uh, this is not based on superconducting circuits. This is simply a different approach. But a key point here is that they estimated that completing the same task on, again, classical supercomputers would take now approximately a billion years. Again, we can debate the exact number of years, but there is now a, 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 a large and growing separation between what is easy on a quantum device and what is difficult or even impossible on a classical device. Okay, uh, it is uh, very important to mention that the particular task that was performed in these experiments is not a useful one. The task uh, uh, was created really uh, with a goal, the purpose of demonstrating the difference between quantum and classical. Uh, it's not solving a, a problem of value. So there is still much work uh, to be done to turn these devices into useful quantum computers. We need to improve the quality of every component of these uh, devices, and we need to increase the number of qubits. But the message is that significant advances are being made. Très bien. Maintenant que j'ai parlé de la science, j'aimerais parler de la position du Canada dans le domaine euh, et aussi vous parler des investissements en quantique à l'échelle internationale. So first, Canada has a long tradition of excellence in quantum. We have research centers in quantum from coast to coast. As I've already mentioned, we have founding figures of the field, Gilles Brassard being one of the many examples of leading Canadian researchers in the area. We also have strategic networks such as CIFAR, which for the last decades have brought uh, Canadian researchers together, but also more local examples such as Quantum Alberta and Intrigue in Quebec. And a few years ago, uh, uh, now there was significant funding through the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, CIFREF, of centers of excellence in quantum at UBC, Waterloo, and Sherbrooke. Something else that we have is a growing quantum startup economy, community. Uh, per capita, the number of startups in Canada is larger than the US. I think that's an interesting achievement. And these companies are playing an essential role in building the quantum ecosystem in Canada. They are assuring that the students that are trained in Canadian institutions with Canadian infrastructures can stay in the country after their study to continue to contribute to the development of these technologies and to our economy. Uh, um, focusing on uh, uh, what is going on at the national level now, I've already uh, mentioned that companies worldwide have, have understood the potential of quantum science and technologies. The same is true of many countries that have enacted national quantum strategies. And what I'm showing here, that this figure is taken from a very recent CIFAR report on quantum technologies, a report that I encourage you to, uh, to look at. And what we're seeing in light red here are countries that have enacted coordinated national quantum strategies. For example, in Europe, 
uh, their one billion uh, euro uh, quantum flagship. Uh, and more recently in the, in the US, the 1.5 uh, US, uh, uh, 1.5 billion US dollar national quantum initiative. In light blue and dark blue are countries with significant government endorsed endorse initiatives or countries that are participating in these initiatives. In dark red are countries with quantum strategies in development. And I'm very happy that with the budget that was released Monday, we can now change Canada's color. I, I, I'm very happy, I'm very much uh, uh, looking forward to seeing how our national quantum strategy will be deployed. Again, from the same CIFAR report, uh, it's interesting to look at what are the policy measures that were chosen, that were enacted by the different uh, countries with national strategies. So ER4 of these measures, and the number is the number of countries that have chosen that particular measure. And so we see that most, if not all, have decided to uh, fund centers of excellence. Uh, other measures that were uh, funded are targeted calls for, for proposals, direct funding for special projects, and uh, startup investment and venture capital. And I've already mentioned the importance of these for the, 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 the quantum ecosystem. So although different countries have enacted different measures. One thing that everyone agrees with is the importance of increasing training in quantum science and technology. There was a recent article in the New York Times which outlined the shortage of um, quantum technologies researchers worldwide. And because of the importance of these technology, this shortage was uh, outlined as a it was identified as a potential national security issue. And so something that all countries agree with is therefore the importance of training more, uh, of supporting the training of more physicists, engineers, uh, mathematicians, computer scientists, and chemists with knowledge in quantum. And so in the last, the very last few slides of this presentation, let me tell you about some of the steps that we've taken at this Sukhotsik to address the situation, thanks to CFREF funding. And I will explain uh, these initiatives using an example, example of David Wagi. So David was a PhD student in physics at the Institute Sukhotsik. And by the end of his studies, he had like many students, uh, some very nice papers, but he also had a patent describing a new type of quantum magnetometer, a quantum sensor with applications from the health sector to the mining industry. The problem, if you will, with a sensor was that it, it, it was very much a physics experiment. And by that, I mean that it was literally the size of a small kitchen, not something that is easily deployed in the field. So to move this quantum science to a quantum technology, David took advantage of the seed funding program at the S2 Quantic. The particularity of this program is that it's open to the all quantum community from faculty members, but also graduate students, postdoc, research scientists, and technicians. And thanks to this program, David was able to secure the funding, uh, the resources that were needed to develop a prototype based on his ideas. And so teaming up with engineers at the ASU Quantic, he was, he was able to realize an NL version of his sensor. And this has motivated him to create SB Quantum, a, a startup, a quantum startup company in Shabok that is empl employing about 50 people now. For the ASU Quantic, the decision of funding, of, of, of helping uh, uh, David was an easy decision to make and a small investment. But the return has been tremendous. In particular, I think, rather crucially, it has motivated other students to create their own start quantum startups in Shabok. But uh, that story is far from over. Uh, in particular, with additional support from the Canadian Space Agency, and again, in collaboration with the Institute he was able uh, to further miniaturize his quantum sensor, which thanks to the CubeSat initiative will be deployed in, in space from the International Space Station in 2022. Uh, 
what is clear to me is that we need more examples like this from coast to coast. We need more students like David who are trained in quantum science and given the opportunity, the, the support to contribute to the development of quantum technologies. We need more examples of students like David who receive the appropriate training and the support to become young entrepreneurs and to create their own quantum startup. So what are the main messages here? First, quantum makes the impossible possible. Quantum technology will be transformational, but transformation, in particular, business transformation takes time. If Canadian companies wait for quantum technology to be fully mature before they start investing, it will be too late. Uh, companies worldwide are already investing. Now is the time to start. I would have to convince you that beyond technology, the quantum advantage is talent. We need to train more engineers, physicists, computer scientists, mathematicians, and chemists with knowledge in quantum. But the good news here is that Canada is not playing catch up. Uh, 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 Canada is the leader in quantum research with a critical mass of researcher and infrastructures. We have a unique opportunity to take advantage of here. Et finalement, en terminant, j'aimerais vous remercier pour euh, l'invitation à nouveau à vous parler et je serai très heureux de prendre vos questions. Merci. Thank you, Alexandre and Nathalie. I am uh, very thrilled now to invite the Honorable Carol Hughes, Assistant Deputy Speaker and Deputy Chair of the Committees of the Whole, to offer her closing remarks. Oui, bonjour. Hey, merci beaucoup, Dr. Blais. Uh, you know, I would tend to think that uh, when it came to quantum physics, I thought, oh my gosh, what do I know anything about that? And I think you did the, the you brought the possible from the impossible for me to have that understanding. So thank you. <laughs> I do want to acknowledge that I am on the, on the traditional territory of the Algonquin uh, Anishinaabeg people. I want to thank Paxi uh, and their uh, partners for hosting this very uh, informative and uh, interesting um, uh, event. Uh, I also want to just mention that, you know, I do sit on the all party health research caucus here uh, on the Hill and understand and recognize the importance that research uh, plays uh, in Canada and that, you know, you've indicated how we are a leader in this, um, in quantum physics. And I think that we can certainly be a leader uh, throughout the world because we have lots of um, bright people, uh, bright researchers and, and, and doctors uh, in Canada. And so, you know, we need to capitalize on that. So, um, you know, I want to thank you again for your very uh, informative uh, presentation, which I think has brought obviously more questions um, that could be answered in such short time, but uh, uh, appreciate all that you are doing uh, to move us uh, forward uh, in uh, the uh, delivery of, of quantum physics and the innovation, I should say, is the word of quantum physics. So, merci beaucoup. Ça nous a fait plaisir de vous avoir parmi nous et ça m'a fait plaisir uh, d'être ici pour te, te remercier. Merci. Merci pour l'invitation encore. Merci beaucoup, uh, uh, Madame Hughes. Uh, as you can see, uh, the future of quantum is very nigh, is very near. So, and, and I thank you all for coming to this wonderful talk by one of our leaders in Canada in the industry. Merci beaucoup d'être venu. We hope you enjoyed the session today and be grateful if you would fill the short survey uh, that will appear in your browser at the end of the session. Next month, we head west on May 13th. Uh, for our next virtual event featuring Dr. Don Lawton from the University of Calgary, who is going to be uh, who is going to be present, uh, who is pre oh, sorry, who will be present another very timely talk on the subject of zero carbon economy. The title is "On the Path to a Net Zero Carbon Economy." 
carbon capture, utilization, and storage, another extremely important subject for Canada. Please keep an eye out for the registration details coming soon. For information about bacon and egg heads, uh, uh, events, you can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. And thank you very much to all that helped organize this meeting and participated and stay safe.